Hello and welcome to Microservices Out in the Wild. My name is Derek Ferguson and I'm the head of technology for Fitch Solutions. Fitch Solutions provides credit and macro intelligence solutions. We're a wholly owned subsidiary of Hearst, which is a leading global diversified media, information and services company with more than 360 businesses worldwide. I'm joined today by my head of architecture, Matt Jones, and his head of shared services, Rashid Mohammed. Together, we're going to share with you the story of Fitch Solutions' journey from Monolith to microservices. I started Fitch Solutions with a single, all-encompassing goal for the organization. I wanted Fitch Solutions to become the number one technology destination for motivated software engineers anywhere in the world. That's a pretty lofty goal, but as it says in Chapter 64 of the Tao Te Ching, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And so, for my first step, I decided to assess the development culture in our organization and ask myself if the way we were creating and publishing our software really matched the way that the best developers I know like to work. Out of this assessment, I formulated a vision for our organization that's captured on this slide. I tried to keep it simple, and I tried to make sure that it was holistic so that anyone in any role on our team can use this as their North Star in making any technology decision going forward. Put simply, I want developers deploying code production multiple times a day without the need for non-developer involvement or off-hour scheduling. Product, empowered to release new features according to their desired schedules and target audiences. QA, integrate in ways that allow laser focus on release features likely to impact stability. Now, here's Matt Jones to tell you about the challenges he and his team anticipated. Eric? Our Fitch Connect platform is composed of about 150 different microservices, providing different parts of data and functionality to the front end. Historically, we've done continuous integration on all of these back end services, but we wanted to transition to full continuous delivery, which is a pretty big transition. To transform toward continuous delivery requires changes in architecture, development, and testing processes. Today, we're going to walk you through primarily the architecture changes required. Thank you, Matt. Fitch Solutions offers four primary interfaces to our customers. First, our flagship web interface for interactive data browsing known as Fitch Connect. Second, our API interface for programmatic data retrieval. Third, a simple SFTP data feed that allows our customers to download data in bulk. And last, but not least, a Microsoft Office plugin that allows data download directly into Microsoft Office documents. As you can see from the diagram, there were some challenges inherent in the way these systems had evolved over time. Although an excellent job had been done in getting all the user interaction mechanisms to ultimately flow through the API on the back end, there were still multiple data sources strewn across the back end, requiring extensive heterogeneous joins for most operations. Also, the interactive web client that sees the majority of our traffic was a monolith that could not be updated without a complete redeployment of the entire system. Concepts like domain-driven design analysis and T-shaped resources had not yet been incorporated into the corporate vernacular, much less incorporated into our DNA. Now here's Matt to tell you about the technologies he and his team chose to deliver on our vision. In early 2016, we introduced Kubernetes into our then on-premise environment. We continue to run Kubernetes in our cloud-hosted environment. One of the biggest advantages we were hoping to see in containerization was the streamlining of DevOps. When embracing microservices, before we knew it, we had over 100 unique services running in our environment. And the container orchestration has proven valuable time and time again. Some benefits we've seen from Kubernetes include the automatic recovery of failed pods, it really is amazing to, uh, that when you say that I expect that there, there's always going to be three instances of this type of pod. When one fails, Kubernetes takes care of it without text messages or phone calls or any other ceremony. The automatic horizontal pod auto-scaling also lets us scale up instances of a type of service when there is more demand for that specific service. Also, our relationship with our cloud engineers has been streamlined. They ensure the availability of the kube cluster, and we ensure the reliability of our applications. This automatic management of cluster resources that Kubernetes provides has been a critical building block in our microservices journey. Thank you, Matt. Static code analysis was already in use at Fish when I arrived, but its use was in its infancy. 
A centralized scanning complex would assess code across all branches and produce scores in aggregate for every sub-organization. While this allowed the organization to judge quality and spot overall trends, it fell short of what was needed in order to enable our goal of developers deploying directly into production on their own recognizance. In order for static code analysis to give us what we need here, there are several enhancements required. First, developers have to be able to determine, prior to checking their code in, whether or not they are likely to be breaking any of the quality rules around important things like security, unit test coverage, or reliability. Second, if such code makes it into our repository, our scanning complex has to automatically prevent it from proceeding to deployment, alerting all relevant team members to a new quality issue requiring their immediate attention. As you'll see in our upcoming slides, the solution to both of these shortcomings was the inclusion of sonar cube analysis into our CI-CD pipeline. Now, here is Rashid Mohammed to tell you why Kafka is an essential element to our new architecture. Thank you, Derek. Let's look into another technology that we have utilized here, which is Kafka. Kafka is a distributed messaging application that helps us decouple different microservices and helps us deliver a responsive application. Kafka is implemented as a cluster of brokers, as you can see from this picture, broker one, two, and three, which is a cluster. And that cluster is kept in sync by an ensemble of zookeepers, which are shown in the, on the bottom of the screen. The cluster of brokers interact with external systems, which are producers and consumers. On this picture, we have shown a topic, which is a data stream in Kafka and that data stream can be broken up into multiple partitions which you have seen here. Each partition is a unit of parallelism and that helps us expand or scale uh, the ability to manage messages and interact with different applications. The partitions can further be divided by into replicas and that replicas help us maintain the fault tolerance of uh, the uh, messages. At Fitch, Kafka is a lot more than a simple messaging system. Kafka provides an infrastructure to deliver an ordered stream of events. And with Kafka, we can keep those events for a very long time. In this picture, service A and service C might have traditionally talked to a shared database. In our event sourced world, any data changes to a model are simply published to a topic. And services that need to listen for the changes subscribe and prepare a local representation that is optimized for delivery. Moving from a shared database architecture to a local database backed by an event source topic has helped us to deliver incremental improvements by our clients by allowing us to have multiple versions of the same service running at once. Another important tool that has enabled that is Istio, which Rashid is going to speak to. As we further look into different technologies that we have implemented in this application, before we get into that, let's understand why we were looking for this technology. So in the current ecosystem, we have multiple pods interacting with each other, and each of these pods have different uh, functionalities built into it. These functionalities were mostly related to the infrastructure, not related to the business. Some of these functionalities are highlighted on this diagram here, are timeouts, access control, circuit breaker, tracing, retries, and if you look at it, we have different set of applications handling it differently and at various degrees. And that brings us to a point where can we have these implemented in a standard fashion and also when we are doing this a standard fashion, we don't want to do it in a library and the library is embedded into our application. We don't want a change in the timeout procedure should ha demand a building or rebuilding of an application. So with that in mind, we were searching for a framework that will take these dependencies out of the application where the application becomes leaner and only related to the business. So if application has any infrastructure related uh, changes or functionalities that is bloating the application unnecessarily. With that in mind, we 
stepped into service mesh. There are multiple implementations of service meshes, and we have uh, investigated many and identified STO as a matured application, matured product to be used. And we will look into that further in our next slide. The diagram here shows how the STO is implemented. On the left hand side is the control plane and this control plane is where all these infrastructure functionalities are implemented like access control, tracing, timeouts, circuit breakers and rate limiting. All of these functionalities were implemented inside the application before. Now we have pulled out of that from the application, made the application leaner and only related to the business. And on the right hand side, you will see the data plane. That's where all the application pods are installed. Istio is implementing this functionality or this infrastructure by injecting an Istio proxy in the pod. So each pod is now surrounded by Istio proxy. Any interaction with that pod or that application embedded in the pod is via the Istio proxy. With that proxy is the control plane in, in, in complete touch and that's how comp control plane is managing the uh, different functionalities. So if we have an application A talking to application B and if it would need a retry because of some failures then that is implemented outside of the applications as a control plane, as an STO functionality. And that functionality can be tuned and adjusted without changing anything in application A or application B. And that's the base of how STO has been effective in making this work. And here's where we bring it all together. You'll see across the top, we still have the main delivery channels, but web is composed of a set of micro UIs, which each talk to their own dedicated service on the back end. Event sourcing allows each service to have a local cache of the data that is optimized for responding to customer requests. Those databases in each service are temporal. They only exist as long as that version of the service exists and they get populated at startup by replaying the messages from the Kafka topics. The red service A in the middle is a second version of the service that's running. Istio enables us to have two versions of any service running at the same time. And Istio enables us to route traffic to the right service based on the user's profile. And that's the key for the vision that Derek outlined. We want to deploy to production all the time, but we want our product team to decide when to release the feature to customers. In order to deploy continuously, we rely on several automated checks, including unit tests, integration tests, acceptance tests, and security scans, which all run automatically as part of the build pipeline. If any of those fail, we do not deploy to production. And when that's done, the service will be deployed into production as a parallel version that's not receiving traffic. Product decides when features should be made available to users and which users should see the features uh, through our admin tools. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. As you can see from the diagram, decomposing our systems into a set of vertically aligned microservices enabled us to produce software faster, cheaper, and with higher quality. This is possible because every business function provided by our system is able to exist as a self-sufficient microservice that can be freely upgraded without impact to its peers. The user interface is no longer a monolith, but instead a set of micro UIs that can be separately versioned as the needs of our customers change. The services talk to each other, but only across a well-defined event bus maintained in Kafka. Rather than multiple data sources requiring extensive heterogeneous joins, we have decomposed our databases into domain-specific caches of data in some cases, and eliminated them completely in others, relying instead on a history of state changes to assemble a picture of current state whenever a new service version is started. 
All of these services are maintained by resources with specialties in some technologies and a breadth of shallower knowledge in others, or as it's known in the industry, T-shapedness. For example, some of our developers are experts in the Vue.js technology that drives our user interface, but still understand enough of Java Spring to maintain our services. Others, for example, are experts in databases like Mongo, but can do a little bit of Java or Vue.js as the need arises. And now, at long last, a demo of our new architecture by Reshid. Recently, we have integrated COVID-19 Leverage Finance Intelligence Reports into Fitch Connect Web. For this demo, I have selected two files, one as invalid, the other is not, and we will take a look at that here. So let's start with pushing the invalid file into the GitHub. So we're going to push this in, and that's when we will have our bamboo start. The file has been pushed. We see the bamboo plan got triggered and it failed. Let's look at the cause of failure here. And if you see, it's talking about an exception that it's expecting and not empty, but it got an empty for the file name. Going back to our files here, we have our valid file. Let's copy this valid file into the working folder and we will replace the existing file with the new file. Once this file is replaced, let's push this to GitHub and we see our bamboo pipeline working and as we complete on that we see the build has been completed and and there you go we have a change in this document that is showing up here we have a 0403 document which we just added and a 0325 document and the other document has been pushed out on behalf of Fitch Technology we hope you've enjoyed today's demo